What kind of waste? Uh, waste is waste. What type of waste? What's the proper name of this waste? Urine. But what do we filter? What, yeah, but what kind of waste is getting into that blood? We have to filter. How about metabolic waste? Waste that makes that out. You like that one? Metabolic waste is why we have a urinary system. Those are all what our cells kick out. So these cells, you know, produce toxins that the body has to get rid of. Okay? I'm here talking. Mm -hmm. um, so, in that case, that's the main things that, and how does it maintain an internal homeostasis? What's it doing? What, what are a couple of things that kidneys really play a big role with? Salt. Well, not salt, you say electrolyte balance. So, electrolyte balance. So what are the electrolytes? Iron. Why would that one like to drink? Ions. What kind of iron? Sodium, potassium, chlorine, calcium. There's many more, but for the sake of people that say, those are the four major ones our body plays with. By doing that, also by maintaining, what else is it maintained in your body? pH, right? How? Well, water balance. So that's how it maintains your acid base balance, your water balance. Okay? So the kidneys will regulate if you need to retain food or retain it. You need to get rid of excess fluids, it does. So that's one way it controls pH also, by regulating the hydrogen ion. That's what the kidneys read. Okay, that's this key thing that it's reading. When it, when it does break down in the metabolic way, especially is urea. It's especially as what? Urea, which is your breakdown of the purine metabolism. And then it becomes your, you know, that's what it's getting rid of. A lot of times in the blood, they'll look at blood levels of urea in the bun, blood urea and nitrogen levels. Those rise too high, the person's going to die. If they start filling, they start not going to hunger, you're going to the ischemic state, you're going to the renal failure. So your kidney's not handling it. All right, so that plays a big important role. So, it also will, it will reabsorb glucose because it's supposed to, it's not supposed to go into the urine. So we absorb that. What molecule should not be able to pass through? What big biomolecule should not be able to pass through the mass? Protein. So, protein. That should never be in your urine. If you're really stressed or ingesting tons of protein because you're a muscle head, you're going to probably trace some in your, in your kidney. And that's not a good thing. If you trace the protein, that means that virus is under a lot of stress. Okay, so certain things shouldn't be in there. Glucose should not be seen in urine. Protein shouldn't be seen in urine. Glucorase shouldn't be seen in urine. Why? That means it's bacterial infection going on. So, you know, sometimes you'll throw a blood cell here and there. That'll be there. So mainly urine is just water, salts, and urea. That's primarily what urine is. And urea is a very toxic substance that our body gets rid of. Because that's how it gets rid of the protein by breaking that down into that simple form. Okay, so that's pretty much what should be in your urine. The pH of your urine should be a little on the acid side. And it should be a nice straw yellow color, not dark orange. So clear that you see right through. That means you're overhydrated. It's dark orange, you're underhydrated, you're dehydrated. So you get an increase of fluid levels. Not from beer, water and stuff like that. Okay. Um, the structures we have: we have two kidneys, two ureters, a bladder, and a urethra. So we go on. Let's go on. So there it is for real. Jesus. There's the make-believe world. There's the real world. Big difference the way it looks. Notice the being a caver in the aorta. Don't they look just beautiful, red and blue, just like in your models? No. No. <laughs> no. No. This one here would feel like a nice fettuccine noodle. This is feels like a lot of tissue on the touch. So never let you noodle in there. They're retroperitoneal organs, as you can see. They fade in the back. And now we get to the inside. 
So the kidney has a hyalus structure, just like the lung did. Hyalus means it grows out from the, that's the root of the organ where it grows out from. And in the hyalus you have an artery, a vein, and a urine. That's how things enter and leave this organ. And we have the outside region known as the cortex, the middle region known as the medulla, and the inside region known as the pelvis. Pelvis, is that too loud? Let me shut this door. You guys can hear me all right? Yeah, pelvis. All right? So in that, we break that medulla area down further into pyramids and columns. You know columns, you know pyramids. The columns is how the blood supply gets up there to be filtered in this region of the cortex, and mainly most of your tubules and collecting ducts will be in these pyramids to bring this back towards the pelvic area. Okay? So you start here and work this way. So blood will come in, filter, so it will be filtered, so the venous structure will take it back out that's been filtered, and if we need to get more in, you have what they call you will learn in physiology, the justa glomerular system. It's where you got the venous structure, uh, capillary structure, you see the venous site, right up against the glomerulus to take more in or out if it has to, known as the justa glomerular system. Yeah. So that plays a big role along with your filtering because that's where a lot of reabsorption or secretion of more out will take place before it finally gets to the final final collecting dump, which I'll show you in a second. So we finally drain into our pelvis. Pelvis has two areas in it also. You have minor calyces in the small cup, and the major calyx here. And then this is just the base of the pelvis where it's going to fall into the urine. What are the yellow tips on the columns? These? Yep. This back. I don't know. Just to get that. So you say it goes up the columns? It goes up the columns and you filter. Yeah, I'm going to show you that now when we get into it. So we're going to slowly work our way now to the, to the nephron. The nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. Each kidney has 1.25 million nephrons. So all together, 2.5 million nephrons in the body. Why do we have so many individual nephrons? So two giant ones, one in each kidney. Why do we have so many? So you can get kidney stuff? So you can. Why don't I just have two big nephrons? One per kidney? Because one stops working. Okay. And what else? A lot more done. So that means I have increased surface area. That's the magic word surface area. The magic word in physiology surface area. Surface area. Why do we have all these glomerulized surface area? Why do we have all these villi surface area? Why do we have all these um, alveoli in the lung surface area? Got it? Surface area. Science, biology loves surface area. So just remember that. And they literally taught you on your interview about surface area questions. And you go for the job. Why is it like this? Magic word is surface area. And they're all happy. Yeah, surface area. You're good. You have to be good. Yeah, shut up. Hi. You're done. So the glomerulus pretty much is your filter. The tubules are designed for absorption or secretion. You got it? Filter and absorption and secretion. That's all you need to know about this. Physiology, this is a nightmare. These osmolarity pressure changes. And so much happens here, and you know when all the hormones that come in and make this stuff change. So the glomerulus filters. And the tubules absorb or secrete. If we leave it at that, because we're an animal. So when you're at this point, you're just a filtrate. By the time you get here, you're urine. Okay? You're urine. So when you're in the tubules, the loop of handling, the, dis the proximal and distal collecting tubules to the collecting duct, collecting duct finally becomes urine. That is going to come down and pour into the, to the, you know, the pelvis. Yes, that's an exciting thing. So remember how many there are, 
which one filters, which one absorbs. So you don't need to know. Okay? The grammar. Yeah. That's the filter. Because that's why your capillaries run in. The just the glomerulus is where it changes its mind and these things are close approximation. It just kicks something out and it decides I want it back. How many are 2.5 million altogether. So it's 1.25 each kilo. Yeah. And this is showing you a real pile of gram, maybe. Probably looking for kidney stones. So what is a kidney stone? Great stone to get into your urine. I saw a nice like shovel on the side there and some new kidney. It's like, damn. Well, there, there are three types, really. <coughs> One type is genetic. And that's your cystic, homocystic body can't handle uh, cystic at all. So that's a genetic one. So I don't want to talk about that. But the other three are the calcium type stone is the most common, calcium oxalate. That's a person mainly common in young people, like 40 or young, because they don't hydrate enough. And what happens if you don't hydrate enough, if your kidney has a hard time filtering, so it can take, leave residual calcium oxalate deposits. Now, oxalic acid will get into the gut, and when you clear it out is with calcium. As calcium goes through, it clears, oxalates out. Foods rich in oxalates, I Thick, dark green leafy vegetables is where you find it. There's also this calcium, there's also a lot of oxalic acid. If you're a person that has a tendency that you can't filter this product, you have to cut that amount down that you're ingesting because you can create kidney stones in yourself. I mean, the biggest one is broccoli, spinach, kale. Okay, but the kale's not as bad as the spinach and the broccoli, believe it or not. I'm doing that. So, you know, the thing is, make sure you're hydrated if you're going to eat a lot of this stuff. Because it is good for you, it's good, especially broccoli. Broccoli is a natural scrubber to scrub all your intestines and keep it healthy. It works well. It has a lot of function because of the oxalic acid being cleansed through. So, if everything's working well, you're fine. If you're a person for some reason does not metabolize this stuff well, then you, you got to limit it. you got to limit your calcium intake, too. So, so they're common in the young people. Then we have what we call uric acid stones. Uric? Uric. And those are people that like that have gum. They can't break down the urea properly to the uric acid to get rid of it. So it crystallizes in their kidney. If it's crystallizing in the joint, it's doing the same thing in the kidney. So they actually get true uric acid stones. <laughs> Wow, they, 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 they do stupid things like that in college too. Yes. We do idiotic things here too. Like we do <laughs> and not much change here. When I see things broken walking out this path, I say, you think this is a high school where things are busted and broken? Because, you know, that's one thing. Happy job teaching high schools. 80 cleanse discipline in the class that list sits there like this. Why? Then you get a date. <laughs> see, in high school, I can send them to the principal's office. I can't send them to the president's office. So, we have to. They were scared of them. That's long as they have a free time. All right, so, so that's your uric acid stone, okay? They crystallize inside the kidney. So, you know, they usually put people on programs, and it works well for that. If you have this problem, just a drink, like any plant of any, a maraschino cherry juice, the true cherry. You know, it's expensive, but it'll help filter this product out. You don't have to be on heavy drugs if you have this gum problem. Limit the stuff you're not supposed to eat. We're known as rich man's disease. Why? Because it's high in red meats, shellfish, and expensive liquids, like scotch, and all the liquids. So, years ago, we rich people afford them. Now, everybody gets drunk and this and stuff. So, <laughs> so, it's not a rich man disease. Probably still in other countries, it is in another The last one is infectious stones. Why do we get stones 
with infections because the pH is too high in the urine. So that can create stones. So those are your three basic types. Okay, the other type you're going to have in your life that you do you know, this can't have a system of amino acids. There's a problem with genetic. <sighs> What was the first one? Calcium oxalate. Calcium oxalate. Okay. We don't need to know what we have No. No, no they, they exist, okay? More for your information, because you guys kind of, have kind of gone towards healthcare, so I hope you do retain some of this stuff and then please. Okay, so now we go to the bladder next. Let's look at the female bladder. Bigger. So the urines do nothing, they're nothing but tubes to connect my kidneys to my. Black. So we get in the black. And again, we're in the black now. Why do we want the urine to be a little more acidic than alcohol? To prevent bacterial infections. Exactly, bacterial infections. And you can see why in the female it's so much easier for her to get infections in her bladder than the male. The male most likely will get prostatitis over a cystitis. Because the prostate will kind of block it from making its way into the to the bladder. So the bladder is nothing but a hollow, muscular, smooth muscular organ, which has an internal sphincter, which is under autonomic control, and an external sphincter, which is your urogenital diaphragm right here. And that's what that's your learned reflex of that skeletal muscle. So the ones up in here would be smooth muscle, skeletal muscle. Okay, just like in the study guide, what's a sphincter? It's a ring of muscles, it could be skeletal or smooth, with only two, and an uh, open organ. A uh hollow -huh. organ. Right. It, it can open and close off the hollow organ. Right. Simple as that. <coughs> the female urethra is only 4 centimeters long or 1.5 inches. That's why it's much easier to put it fully up in here than the main. Is that why women have to like urine more often? Yeah, because you get a short urethra and it's more common. Males just have a little bigger blood. Males will urine a lot, but nothing comes out, the prostate gets big and swollen. So what is the lining of this tissue lining? What was the tissue that lined this? Is it transitional? Transitional epithelium, and it's hooked together with type of junction. Tight gap or desmosomes. Right, why? No, no clue. Just just that stretch that. Stuff can't get through. Bingo. You can stretch them, but they won't let go. Put the Huh? Put the So, good job. So, remember that. That's what, that was one of the weird organs for transitional epithelium, meaning you have all three types in there, three shapes, and the hook of desmosomes. Okay? So, why? So, urine don't seep back into your body. I mean, it'd be wonderful your pelvic area full of urine. Thank you, it's nothing. Then we look at the nail. It looks like a rocket ship, right? Starship Enterprise, there's a control room there. It's the jet engine, right? So, we have prostatic urethra. Remember this urethra? Spongy urethra. So we got three areas of urethra. And it's approximately 20 centimeters, centimeters long. Four or seven inches. Seven inches. Seven, yeah, roughly. That's 2.5 times seven. It's about right. Well, it's going all the way into it, too. Yeah. Sorry. We're not just talking about what's sticking out, we're talking about what's inside, too. So you can see, and first of all, is it nice and straight like this for you? No, it's not. So if you look at it from a lateral view, there's the female, hers is nice and kind of straight. Look at the males. You gotta go around a lot of bends and, and hooky things to get that <laughs> that fully up in here. We don't want to go here, we don't want to go here. You know, and so it's very uncomfortable. Why would we have to go in here? Because this thing is small like a balloon. So the urine can't get through. You have benign hypertrophy. Prostate. So this one of the urethra in the male is longer, it has three names to it, the females has one name, it's only four centimeters, the male is twenty centimeters. Okay? 
That's the key to open that. What's the function of the urethra? Avoid the bladder. So what? Avoid the bladder. And the proper name for your name again was? There's the word. What did say up here? Nectrician. Nectrician. That's the, that's the true name of your name. So we have to go to the bathroom next time and ask somebody, where's the nutrition room? <laughs> right. I can go to the bathroom. I can go take a bath. Yeah. Right? So yeah, so where's the bathroom? Yeah. Or restroom. I think the funniest thing ever when I was a kid, they did it like hand in camera. The guy says, oh, where's the restroom? He goes in there. Instead of being urinals and toilets, it's all table, <coughs> all little benches. Everybody's laying down. There's <laughs> <laughs> a restroom. Well, you said you asked for the restroom, but everybody's resting. <laughs> so you don't rest in there, right? You do nasty things. Yes. Well, you need to find it. Or the restroom come from there. There was a room like that. The ladies were closest, so that they could use it in every room. Right. And that's when they were really fast. Yes. It was just a room. Right. So and that went outside. Yes. <laughs> So we went well, outside, school was a girl. We were the cows. And this is just showing you a response. Now we have sympathetic system going to it, you know, it's a parasympathetic rather. And here's our learned function versus the autonomic function. It's all showing you have two major innovations going to it. We don't care about that. Causes of repeat renal failure. There's two things that are important. Pre-renal means it's happening before the kidney. Don't squeeze your kidneys up big time, an interruption in blood flow. Why? Because you're going about a thing in physiology of glomerular filtration rate. And no matter how much blood is hitting that kidney, that GFR is going to work so hard to keep that in constant. That if the volume falls too low, it can't handle it anymore because it's trying to compensate the, the, the arteries over dilating that eventually It'll just shut down. So hypovolemic shock would do this, meaning a sudden loss of blood would be a big cause of this pre-renal failure. Right. So any type of cardiac condition that's constantly playing with blood volume push, cardiac output, such as congestive heart failure, MI, one of these things, secondarily can cause renal failure. People aren't aware of that. The kidneys are taking a beating every time the heart stops pumping. Is that GFR? The kidney, look, kidneys will filter 180 liters a day of solution. You only kick out one and a half to two. That's it. So you retain a lot. So the kidneys work hard. A lot goes through there all the time. You know, 24 hour urine volume, you're going to give about a liter and a half of solution. That's it. You know? how much beer you drink the night before. Intramural direct damage, inflammation, toxins, infections, screwing the kidney up and stuff. Drugs. You know? Yeah, drugs are the best toxins, drugs. Chemical, heavy chemicals, heavy metal chemicals you're working on will mess it up. Post would be a sudden obstruction, such as a big, big swollen prostate, closing everything off the urine's back from, you know, kidney stones, tumor in the blood. So pre is playing with volume coming to it. In it is going to be infection, stuff like that, something that's aggravating the kidney, such as pyelonephritis, which is going Post renal means like a stone. Think of a stone or a tornado guy with a big prostate. Prostatic cancer. So that's pretty much how you cause renal failure to happen. And most of the time, when somebody starts going into severe heart failure and the backup of everything, eventually what really happens, they become a routine. The kidneys shut off. And then they die. And they're in the body, the liver's are backing up, and the kidneys can't handle it, the kidneys are shut off. The reaction says, that's it, I'm not doing anything anymore. The whole dilates flow and blood just flows through. So if there were um, people learning how to save the transplant's blood, they must have had a lot of like wartime injuries and deaths uh, resulting in kidney failure. Yeah. If, if you can work that out, it makes sense. You would. <laughs> you would. One of them would be what? 
What's the biggest thing that killed you before they do they do on a cross match? Well, but but it makes you know you're supposed to have a positive, I give you B positive. Well, I'm dead. You know. So that was one problem. So the other is infection. If it wasn't done on a clean sepsis is a big problem. Sepsis will shut the kidneys right down. <clears throat> volume loss. A woman with soldier laying there. There's a ton of volume. This kidneys are going to shut down. Right? That's the most common cause of heart problem, cardiac, and renal failure. Once you're septic, once you, once you are septic, there's like no coming back from that, right? Depending. The death rate's very high. But you can't come back. If you've got a strong immune system, they catch you on time, they flood you with the right antibiotic, you'll come back. You know. But there's cases, there was an interesting case in Medscape this week of a woman, 69 years old, with a big swollen face, <coughs> painful, just came out of the hospital, sepsis, and osteomyelitis in the knee. The infection in the knee, and they did surgery, and then she became septic. So they treated that, they discharged. Two days later, her face was swollen big. It like, looked like mumps. My wasn't mumps. It was due to a bacterial infection because even though she had no fever, or even though it would ooze like pus into her mouth because the given way you have an infection in the parotid gland, and it was when they cultured it, it was E. coli. That's a nice one, E. coli. Yes. Right? Wonderful. Must have ate Chipotle. <laughs> One of my other students in the other class, she works. She was working, a guy got out late, she ate a chipotle, he came out of food poisoning. That's why she had to take the, she had to take the practice with you guys on Saturday. That's why I was busting up, and I got to talk with my cats on it. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be gross, wouldn't it? <laughs> cats are bad enough, imagine somebody throwing up in it. Get out, make it hot, okay, move the chunks and figure out what it is. No matter in the fritters, the most common cause of this condition is strep throat left, beta, beta hemolytic strep left untreated. Just like we talked about causing damage to the bowels of the heart, the other place it likes is the glomerulus. And that's just showing you, you know, the big apple. Why would your nervous system be like, why would you be like in a stupor? Like, general place stupor. They go the toxins, your body's not getting rid of them. So it's really not, believe it or not, I mean, it's not a painful death to go with me before. You just finally go under and that's it. Because the toxins are still going to take the brain. So, blue line primary arthritis is. It's just an inflammation or infection of the glomerulus. That's all that's telling you. Most common cause, baby hemolytic strep. This is more an FYI. Not the test challenge. Baby hemolytic one is the one that eats the blood. That's the bad one, yes. That's the one that's the really blue, blue strep throat that, if not treated, will seep away somewhere else in the body. Even though your symptoms go away, it went somewhere else. Either to the leaflets of the heart or the glomerulus. So all at once now, you're like, Say you, this happened to you, you were 17, looks like 25, and you're coming out with a huge infection for no reason. Which is that, that's what the kidney towards, is the infection. You know, so now, now you're going to be on uh, metformin and steroids the rest of your life to keep that going around with your money. Can they detect this after it's not in your Hot. Because you try to culture a live culture, but it's not there anymore. So it's in your blood. You can do a blood test. You can do a blood test, but you can leave it on the other Now I'm scared. No. I didn't go to the doctor last time. Why do they use diabetes? <laughs> huh? Why do they use diabetes? Because it helps the angiotensin system. Angiotensin, conversion of angiotensin 1 to 2. You'll learn that in phase. Base inhibitors. So you don't take in so much sodium, you're pushing it out. So you have cool fluid in your body. Alright, so now we get into the pelvic region. And we're slowly working our way to reproduction. We should slow through today. Okay, so the pelvic area. The pelvic diaphragm is made up of two key muscle groups 
And you go to A9 and Coccygeus. The job of the pelvic diaphragm is so when you go to the bathroom, your organs don't fall into the toilet bowl. So it kind of holds everything in place. Okay? It's a muscular band that holds everything in place. It's not your division line to tell you you are no longer in the abdomen, you're now in the pelvis. Because the division line is the what? The brim, right? The brim. Remember that? All the way back in early February. The pelvic brim. No. The pelvic brim is your dividing line between the abdomen and the pelvis. So don't get sucked into this one on your, on your written test. So know the makeup of the know the makeup of this diaphragm and understand what its function is. And it's only passed by two things in a male, urethra and anus, and a female. What are we going to add to it? Everything. Yes, that thing. That thing. The thumb down, yes. All right. Now let's go, we're going to take you now, now to see this, we did the transverse cup and we looked down in here. To see this view of you, we put you upside down and we spin you. And we're seeing, the, we're seeing, <laughs> oh, that's what that is, that was like, holy crap. We're seeing the current, the perineal area, known as the perineum, which means around the anus. It's not the taint Anus, tank vagina. That's why I was wondering. I'm like, well, he's a man vagina. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the key thing we're looking at here, I mean, this is just like, <laughs> speaking of this. <laughs> All right, so the real thing I want to realize, the male and the female, the pots are the same amount. There's no difference in number, all the same amount of pots. The quality is different. We're going to learn that the quality of the female on the is superior to the male, because everything stays inside and don't hang out. So we have what we call the urogenital diaphragm. UG diaphragm, neurogenital diaphragm. And it's made up of three muscles. And it's like a triangle. It's like a Bermuda triangle. It's dumb blue. Okay. We come across this way where the, the base of the triangle is made up of the transverse perineal muscle. The lateral walls are made up of the ischial cavernosis muscle. Ischial bone, ischial cavernosis muscle. And the center ball, like a circle, is known as the bobo spongiosis. So, and the thing, the inferior border thing that's on the study guide, because I look at that and say, what the hell am I even mean with this stupid thing? I put it. It's more like the inferior border of it would be this region right here, and it would be the bobo spongiosis. What would have been cut years ago on the pediatrics? The bubble spongiosis muscle, they slice into that to open it up more so the baby can get out. So, without ripping it, they thought a clean cut would heal better than a jagged cut, and that's going to make a damn difference in what I don't do anymore. Some doctors do it, all the doctors will, the younger ones will not. So, here we are. So, again, know the three muscles that make this, and they're also seeing what? You made an anai, which is part of what? No, not right. Part of the, the pelvic the diaphragm. diaphragm. Cuts the juice and we get an anion. So, on a study guide where it says inferior board, you just want to know that it's bobo. What much you hit that thing? Okay? So, that's the urogenital diaphragm, which is your perineal area. So, it's seen through the inferior, looking up superior action while standing over an arrow. That's how you would see it. Okay? Like I told you, you can't study it and stand over an arrow. Okay, so now we're going to go into the wonderful world of reproduction. Here we go. The mouth of the function of living in this classroom. Is going to be a practical? Oh, that's so funny. Yes, there will be a practical. Yes, there will be a practical.
there will be a project with David. Only David and no one else. And they, uh, you know, and when we come together in the group. So let's go into that. Wow. Let's look at our testimony. So, you're going to go jump back and forth for a couple of pictures. The test issue, first of all, has two coverings. There's one cover that's hooked right to it, almost like how the pia matter webbed right into the brain and central nervous tissue that you can't separate it. Well, here it is here, stuck on you like glue. All right? So that's why guys think with their other brain. My opportunity is like pia matter. All right? <laughs> So this is a white fibrous connective tissue. Then we have this other one called the tunica vaginalis, which kind of lines the scrotum. And the tunica vaginalis is created by, when this testes descends, it takes a piece of the peritoneum with it down into the sac. And that is the covering that covers the stomatic cord, all the way down, wrapping, lining all around the scrotum. What are the two coverings, though? Albagina and vaginal. See, tunica means layer. Albagina and vaginalis. So the, remember, the, so case on the study guide, I think it says remnants of peritoneum. That's asking for this. So the vaginalis. internal oblique. So as the testis comes down, it takes the internal oblique muscle with it down into the scrotal sac. Right here. Hold this is all muscle, all the muscle. So that's known as cremaster muscle. The function of the cremaster muscle is to elevate or lower the testis to keep them two to three degrees cool in their body temperature so sperm doesn't die. So how do you like make it so that it does die? <laughs> how, how do you keep it stay in stay in hot tubs over 100 degrees all the time and you do knock out the amount of sperm. That's why if you have like sterile tendencies, they tell you you're not, you know, think you're gonna get a pregnant if you live in a hot tub all the time, do because it won't wipe out the sperm. Well, next time we go to the vet, instead of putting the radiation beam in, aim it down there. Right here. Yeah. You ask the <laughs> I like when they put the lead shield on me. I said, like, you know, really, really, I'm worried about. <laughs> okay. So, lower. Lower. You want to keep it cool. So, you notice on a hot day, they hang down to the knee, and on a cold day, they throw it down. They throw it. They jerk. Like a jerk. Right. That's the idea. We also have another muscle here called the dartos, D-A-R-T-O-S, dartos, which, which sits inside the scrotal sac. And that muscle tenses or loosens the sac. So when the dartos, when the uh, gramaster relaxes, the dartos relaxes. When the gramaster tenses, the dartos tenses. And then the scrotal will be nice and tense around it when it's tucked up. And you do have a reflex here called the human step reflex, which is L1. You scrape the inside of the thigh, come off the gracilis with the back of the percussion hammer, up from the knee towards the scrotum. The scrotum will rise on that side. Depends who does it, though. How many times have you done that? <laughs> I know you're going over practice. <laughs> We know you will. He's a regular camera. So, I mean, this guy's not circumcised, kind of gross looking things. So, we also need a, a fibrous cord known as the gubernaculum to help the, ten, the, the testes descend down through the anal canal, down into the scrotal sac. So, with an undescended testicle, does that mean there's a problem with the gubernaculum? 
Okay, so the group of will help the testes descend down, but it goes in the right direction, down into the scrotal sac. Uh, no, not here. No. Oh. Well, I mean, such a She looks at me and goes like this. Said, no, no, no. Don't descend from here. No. Oh, I mean. <laughs> there you go. Know, you're nice. I know. You know, you know, you know. <laughs> now, let's go back to David's favorite subject for testing. What hormone does this thing secrete out? Testosterone. Exactly. Testosterone. Make you rare. Okay, testosterone. Well, the sperm is made in the seminiferous tubules, and it's under meiotic division. Not mitotic, meiotic, or meiosis. What do we mean by meiosis? I just said that. So what do we mean by it? Give me a better definition. Haploid cells. Haploid cells. Thank you. Meaning we have the what? Chromosome number. So these cells have a chromosome number of what? 20. 20. Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Why do we want them to have 23? Wouldn't we be better if they had more? No. No. We gave you like, does that make you have an extra ball? I don't know. Tell you have an extra ball? I wish. <laughs> Don't put a marble there, call me Bojangles. Yeah, this is Bojangles. All right, it's amazing. I knew it was going to happen. I told him. To he behave. That's right, we had a young man in the room and he's. That's okay. Getting an education, he's got a real education. He took his headphones out. He goes to school, he's going to be like, wow, this guy smokes in the front. <laughs> He's the president's son. <laughs> <laughs> Which was President Obama's son. <laughs> I have a person. <laughs> they look a lot like that. So, so here we are. So the sperm is made here. Instead of it, so travels through the meat testes and makes its way into the epididymis. It stays in the epididymis for storage and maturation. What, then what has to mature? Yeah. The tape. The flagella. Right. The tape. The flagella. Because it's not long enough yet. Why do you need that long flagella to make that long swim? Because the strongest swimmer gets the egg first. That's right. Ooh. And lucky sperm will get to the egg. Thank you. Lucky. Most unlucky dads. <laughs> so, what happens now? They store throughout the epithelium, so you have the head, the body, and the tail. Then we finally make our way into the ductus deferens or the vas deferens. Ductus deferens or vas deferens. So throughout most of the vas deferens, until we get to the prostate, it's just cell mass of sperm. There's no semen. It's just sperm. Okay? So sperm ends up. The matazoa, remember, are made in the seminiferous tubule. That's a bit of a sebaxin. Yes, the matazoa thing is on your study card, where they produce seminiferous tubule. No, they travel from the vast effort. That's their route, but they produce in the seminiferous tubule. What is producing? Magic. Magic. Uh, there's a real one. This is David, you don't need to be. Now, what would sit in the spermatic cord be? Artery, vein, nerve, dermastic muscle, and vas deferens. So there's a lot of things in there. So there's a difference between spermatic cord and the vas deferens. The spermatic cord is bigger, it contains more things. The vas deferens is just that one, two. So the sperm comes around, and all the way to here, to the, this the ejaculatory duct, it's just sperm. Finally, when it gets here, this, these two accessory glands known as seminal vesicle, and the prostate, 
who pour semen into it. And what is semen? S-E-M-A-N. A buffer solution. Why? The lady pops from the acidic, so the acidic in, in the vaginal canal. <laughs> is this oh, yeah. a process that goes on all the time? All the time, not yes. just while you're reproducing. No, oh. men reproduce until we die. Okay. So men, males who keep producing sperm until we die. Then, you, when you look at the meiosis pictures from you on the Sabbath, one cell will give us four sperm cells. Where the female, that's not the case. One only gives one in three colobies, which die. But so here we go. So now we come down to here, and you know. So when we get down around the membranous urethra, we get towards the spongy. There's another gland over here called bobo urethral gland, which is also known as Cowper's, C O W P E R S, Cowper's glands, and they secrete a lubricant that will come out first. To clean up the urethra and lubricate it, and that's what dribble is, people. No way. You want the dribble because it's going to lubricate the head, and the female has similar glands in the entrance of the vaginal canal to do the same thing, so your coitus isn't painful. That's dribble before or after? No, before, not after. After, that's, that's I'm like dead serious. I no, that's before, like this dribble, like, who did dribble? No. <laughs> supposed to do that because you're excited David <laughs> 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 Circumcision. 
go to my dental shop and <laughs> it's clean. Okay, so that's the fourth step. And uh, to remove and not to remove. I mean, the Jewish too bad, it's coming off anyway, so it's this religious thing, but in the health world, it keeps it clean. And, and it puts less, pro less pressure on the prostate, studies have been done on this. More people who haven't had this done in prosthetic problems later in life, because they're always hearing a lot more force to get it through the foreskin. It like rolls over this and it makes it look like a turtle. <laughs> okay, so how does this thing erect? Well, it's under parasympathetic control. The parasympathetic system controls two major things in the body our GI tract and your gonads, especially this. So when you take. Um, Cialis, or the other one there, the Viagra blue pill, the magic pill, magic light, no, magic pill, <laughs> magic day. <laughs> All right, so the magic pill, like David says, those are nitrous oxides, nitrous oxide stimulants, so those are going to stimulate the parasympathetic system. So what they're going to do is shut down the venous supply in here, close it off, and open up the arterial supply and engorge it and it will erect. And eventually, the sympathetic system eventually will turn on, or you just get tired of nothing works anymore, and you ejaculate. So the sympathetic system creates the ejaculation. And so your pain, heart rate goes up. So you kind of know when you hit the magic moment, you know. If you don't, and if you don't, it's like, well, you never hit it, so there you go. So you hit your, your happy moment. Yeah. Okay, so the sympathetic system, so it starts in parasympathetic, ends in sympathetic, and then you find it end in whatever. If it's new, then it keeps regenerating. If it's old, then it's like once and okay, good night. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So that's the male. And can you damage this and snap this? Yes, you can. So when it's fully erected, you can, you can snap it. You can snap it half, and if it doesn't get fixed, the person will hemorrhage to death. Okay. And I had first hand news of that from when I first started teaching. I mean, 18 years ago, I was doing the anatomy, and the student told me, oh, yeah, I broke my husband. Smiling face. And I said, How the hell did you break? She goes, Well, I was on a honeymoon and I saw him on the island. She jumped on him and we hit the public phone and snapped it. That's an Get asked which one makes up most of the penis. That's that. What? Oh, that was scary. It looks like a penis. It looks scary. Like a screen. That's where the smiley face was created. <laughs> Doc, well, you you were saying you weren't talking about the dorsal vessels and nerves. You're talking about the corpus cavernosus. Right. Yeah. Nothing about the vessels. No, that's what you're going to board into. It. Of course you have yes. nerves and things. Yes. And if you look at sperm, we, you know, we will end up with four sperm. You know, so eventually we'll get formed. Four sperm will form out of one, you know, one cell of vision. But you go through, what meiosis is, is mitosis twice. And that's what makes the shelf in and the variation of the traits. If you didn't do meiosis, Plus, you, you wouldn't have all this variation of trait. That's when the shuffling takes place. It's like, you know, you may have similar DNA, but it's not identical. It's like the twins. So your brothers and sisters are similar DNA, but there's a separation. You're going to look the same. 
the phenotypes don't look the same. The genotypes might be closer, but the phenotypes are really different. Hence, she could have two, blood, two sisters that have dark hair, dark eyes, and she's blonde, blue eye. But they're all sisters. And because of that shift, when the receptive gene became a matched up, and boom, that's how that happens. That's what it looks like, David. And then the big thing with Mayo is prostatic cancer. So one of the things that between two ways of finding it is digital exam and PSA testing. It's PSA, prostatic serum antigen. It's above the 0.5 mark. You're probably pre-cancerous. So, and by touching the prostate, they can tell. If it's benign, it's very boggy feeling. If it feels just right, in that area, then it's a normal prostate. It feels like this. It's blocky. It's benign. If it feels like this, you probably got a nodule on it. You probably have cancer. So what if you feel, huh? What's the second one that you said? Which one? Benign hypertrophy. No, the the PSA. I think. The PSA. Yeah. Prostate serum, prostatic serum antigen. Every male over fifty, they do this test on routine. That's that's feeling it. Better than that. Yeah, huh? <laughs> what? That's feeling it. What? PSA? No, 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 no. That's blood. That's through the blood. Feeling it is digital exam. Um. And the doctor says, ch, ch, bend over. <laughs> Your ankles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, I was. He was at three hands. Three, three hands were on my back. I thought he was a big He's learning today. He didn't miss out on anything. This, this did this whole education in one hour. It's going to be a question filled day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm going to miss that guy. I'm going to ask you twice a week. Oh, my God. So, that's a common problem with males as like you go to females with the breast and the <laughs> cancer. So prostatic cancer is nasty. You know the metastasize and cause a lot of problems. So now we go to the female. Okay? So in the female, she has ovaries, which are gonna secrete a hormone known as estrogens. <coughs> exactly. And we have two key ligament structures to know about, which are part of the mesenteries in this area. One is the broad ligament and round ligament. The broad ligament is nothing but a folding over of the parietal peritoneum. And it thickens itself. Where the peritoneum just folds itself over, the thickens it becomes strong. And that anchors the uterus and all its attachments in place to keep it there. The bowel ligament is nothing but a thick in the mesentery, which comes off the top of the uterus, the fundus, and runs all the way down to the labia major. Or labia major, like they say. Manual major. So it sounds about the same. Refresh line? Yeah. Labia major. Down to the labia major. So that is similar or homologous. That wrong ligament is homologous to the Yes. in the name. It's an obvious to the amount of your structures. You can do reproduction quick. You guys don't mind sitting a little longer here. Let's do it. Time's out. So, let's see if I can follow the order here so it makes sense.
from the umbilical vein back to the arteries, explaining the three bypass routes and what they're bypassing. Okay? Then the second part of it would be the three diseases of the blue baby. Of the blue baby? Three, three diseases. Well, I want the baby's blue. One's the most severe, but what is the most, what is the pain and doctors? What's the other one? Interceptive defect, which means the fossil, the one no value is closed. And the third is tetralogy of Fallot. So make sure you know that picture, tetralogy of Fallot. You're going to explain the four conditions of the heart. And that's usually the baby don't survive. Tetralogy means four. So is it, going to, is it more or less like this is what's going on with the baby? What is the So in other words, you would say, okay, you'd say it has tetralogy of Fallot. Or take an easy one. So you say it has a patent ductus, which means that right this bypass route, known as the ductus arteriosus, did not close upon birth. So I'm now rooting blood from my pulmonary trunk that is de you know deoxygenated into my aorta with oxygenated blood, and I'm wounding the baby's oxygen levels. Fossil mass, class class, okay? That's, that's it, that's it, you know, so just look it up. There you go, you and it's your fault. You might even know what it is. So let's get into this now, again. So let me see what, all right, so the ovary itself, we talked about the ovary's where the eggs. Now, where the male will keep producing sperm, the female does not, she's born with all her ovaries. Like her union. And by the time she gets the menstrual time frame, Stop to run a half of them. Some of them just didn't end up. They don't need to provide a few more. So over her lifetime, until menopause, she will extrude one, her ovary, or sometimes two, will come out and incite. So every happy 28 days, come and shoot down. It's already out. It happens with the 15th day it comes out. But by the 28, 30 day, we're going to go through the cycle in a second. So, the, so everything is stored, and these are controlled by two hormones, FSH and LH. Powerful stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone. And we'll talk about the hormones we do everything. But they control this. Just like they do in the testes. They control this formation of sperm, and they control the formation of testosterone. Same thing here. They control the maturation of the, of the ovum, and they control the actual production of Estrogen, and that's those two hormones that secrete from the pituitary. And we'll do that with endocrine. But those are the two key hormones they look for to see when you're ovulating. So, from the NEA would extrude out. It'd be picked up by the fimbrae and brought up into the infididium. Now we're now in the overduct or uterine duct, fallopian tube. This thing's got more names than a sewer pipe. And it's unbelievable. I mean, every book you read is a different. I learned this for a little too. Now you don't see that anywhere anymore. Both for dog. Fertilization would take place here, around a little around the ambulance pond. And it would take it anywhere from five to seven days to make its way to here. Okay? So that's pretty much where fertilization would take place. So the sperm literally's got a long way to go to get here. And all takes is one. Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps sperm. And there you go. Okay, so that's the overduct. From the overduct, then we go into the uterus. The uterus is really a strong muscular organ. Primarily all smooth muscle. That myometrium is many layers of smooth muscle. The inside layer is the endometrium, which is very vascularized and really relates heavily to hormone balance. The outside layer is nothing but par parametrium, which is nothing but a, what, a visceral a peritoneum. That's all it is. It's a cover. Okay? So that's the uterus. So the fallopian tube connects the ovary to the uterus. That's its job. What is missing here? Because we don't have these. Oh, okay. Urine hormones. That's what's in the gap, not in the human. Okay? Well, we realize that fact. Then it's separated from the vagina by the cervix and then the vaginal canal. Okay, so that's as far as your 
and talking with a female in a lot of view. And we'll see you later. Here's the development of the of over. Okay. Notice we get four, but we get three polar bodies in one cell that's worth it. So studies have shown now, we've talked to infertility specialists, the prime time frame of ovum is 18 to 22 years old. That's your prime ovum. 18 to 22? And if you're going to have children like when you're 40 years old, they say you should donate eggs and let them be frozen and then plant back in you when you get older. Because your body can handle it. The ovum ages. And that's what they feel is where the DNA breakdown happens for genetic diseases. You gotta remember the mitochondrial, female, the female mitochondrial DNA is much more much more influential than the male. The X chromosomes are a lot longer than the Y. X eventually derived the Y when it got more complicated. So the X was, was here first. In theory, you can clone females. So you don't really, you got to that point, you don't need males anymore, other than to make us little boy toys for them. Other than that, you don't need us. So they are going to become a boy toy in the future. So let's look at, you know, we saw this picture before, and not so much that. Let's look at this picture here showing you ovulation. So you see these two hormones will spike. One to kick the egg out, one to maturation, and to expel the egg at around the 15th day. Either 10 days from when it ends, or 15 days from when it starts, if you're accurate. That's why the Catholic religion believes in this, because it's not accurate. So you're not practicing any type of birth control because you're just rolling the dice every time you go at it. It's, it is. It's like, it's Russian roulette. Don't, don't call it that time, okay. But this is what happens. And then, what would happen if the person got pregnant, the hormone would shift to keep that egg implanted and not extrude it out. So you'd have a shift. So now the, baby, the body goes into a pregnancy state. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't get this rapid drop off you would keep certain hormones where they need to be because you need to keep the progesterones now to help nurture that baby in, inside your uterine wall. Now, in a normal circumstance, the egg will implant to the, to the egg will always implant, but if it's not a zygote, because a fertilized egg is a zygote, the body's going to extrude it. And it takes anywhere from three to five days to block that out. Alright, so that's why you get your new magic friend that you whatever so many days and think, oh, I know you are. You know, this is just showing you the cycle of ovulation is taking place and so forth. So, from here, let's go into the side of killer. It's ovarian cancer. These two things are something that you really have to pay attention to. This is the only signs you're going to get. When you get to these other points, it gets you pretty bad. This thing might have metastasized. But when you're in these early phases, a female will constantly coming in to you saying, I'm always bloaty, I feel full, I'm just uncomfortable all the time. You got to check her out. Between lab work and pelvic ultrasounds and so forth, you can't just let it go. You need to get to go out there and explore and look to make sure you have. You don't play with it because this this thing decides to move. Her likelihood of survival drops drastically. But from here, it loves to go to the greater momentum in those areas. Then it will eventually work its way to the spine and get to the brain. Okay, so that's something you can't ignore. All right. By the time we start getting now. Can a big fibroid cause this symptom here too? And this, yes. I've seen many of those. I referred many of them back to the gynecologist for surgery. How did you find them? MRIs. MRI the robot's fine. I want to see this area too. Big fibroid pushing posteriorly towards the sciatic nerve. 
sent it back, took it out, never had to see the patient again. She was fine. Okay, so you, it's, but pay attention to these signs. This is more FYI stuff. So then we go to the breast. I want to finish with this. Maybe one is done. The breast itself, Mary gland is a modified sweat gland. We said that. But instead of having glands that produce sweat, we have glands known as lactiferous glands that produce milk by a hormone secreted from the anterior. Pituitary known as prolactin. So prolactin is the milk producing hormone. And it's primarily enclosed in fat. Most of it's adipose. And that is a thick and connected tissue, which runs along the top, known as the suspensory ligament, which would be anchoring inside here. And when they do augmentation, that's what they usually go in and tighten up, is that suspensory ligament. That they're back here again and not hanging down here. Once she lays on her back, she has four arms, because it looks really good. It's not a, a, they used to have a slinky years ago. A slinky. Yeah. <laughs> the dark tissue is known as the areola and the nipple. But you have many latiferous ducts. It's not just one. There's many. So, and they'll engorge right you know, near the end phase of their childbirth. And then finally they'll engorge. And, and another hormone will come out with oxytocin to help shoot it out. So that will stay if you breastfeed. If you don't, that's the process will end. So the other thing is, what's the sign of another problem? Breast cancer. It's another nasty thing. So any, any weird change to this, get checked. If it's questionable, go get it checked. My sister was told by one Got a college, oh, it's nothing, it's a fibroid. Ten months later, sees another one because that one's closed. He went through the roof saying, that's cancer. And when they biopsy, it was too late. It moved all over the place in ten months. And she's gone. So there you go. You know, eventually from there, made it to the ovaries and uterus, the mesentery, then to her brain, what took her this past January. So you don't play with it. Anything questionable, <coughs> get it checked. Males too. Are heavier males more apt to getting it because there's more fat? They still, well, males is more genetic based than that. You know, my sister was like a real, you know, thing. Like he's 110, 115 pounds soaking wet, and she got breast cancer. So, how knows? The the protein's not there. My aunt. My mother's sister died of the same type of cancer at the same thing in age, 56 years old. They both died the same, you know, my aunt died many years ago when I died when I first started school to become a doctor. She passed. And my, she, they only kept her alive like three years, and my sister they kept her alive like 11 years with the little chemo they used. But, you know, it ended up being triple negative breast cancer. It started hormone and DNA changed itself to become triple negative. It changed this DNA four times because the tumor was tested up at uh, Dana Fowler. That's why it was so hard to treat. The tumor would actually get wiped at first by the chemo, then it would pull back. It changes the DNA and come back with more of a vengeance than ever. It was unbelievable how nasty this thing was. When, when they put the shunt in her heads to release the hydrocephalus on her, because it was throughout the whole cerebral spinal place, left on the carcinoma of the gene. And they brought the chemo in, and they did a smear first, with probably 100,000 cells per smear. After the chemo, in 12 hours, they were going to have to bend themselves. The chemo made it grow. And that's when they realized, we got to ship to the hospice because it's wiping out the respiratory centers of the brain, which is going to visually be awake and suffocate to death. And that's when they had to finally put her on with, with, with um, you know, good hospice care, and she died in five hours after that. So it was tough. So don't play with it. It doesn't go away by itself. Well, if I don't know it's there, I don't have it. No, it's there, and it will take me. All right, so that's the point. You know, this would show you right here a positive. Cancer is tumor, 
just here, look at here is a we're gonna go with six weeks, not even seven, eight. Because in six weeks the hormonal shift will take place to know is it male or female. And this is showing you the male embryo. Look at the female. It looks identical. So that's the point. And then when you use no proportion, there you go. And now it comes. But